We are now live and recording. We're going to give it just another minute and let that start um, finish coming through as we, we open the room. to keep us on time, I'll go ahead and get us started. I am Lisa Ansbach, the Sealy Director for the Louisville Bar Association, and we are so grateful that you're here with us today. Um, we are waiting for um, the moderator to, to join us, so there may be just a little disruption there. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind at the conclusion, we'll be sending an evaluation out. If you wouldn't mind just to fill that out for us, it gives us um, an idea on programs and how we're doing so far. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to um, our distinguished panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Judge Haney. I um, hope it's um, coming through clearly. I also will ask the other panel members, members to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Judge Erica Lee Williams. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, and we appreciate you joining us. Hopefully, you'll find this informative and we look forward to speaking with you and answering your questions as we can. And I am Kelsey Doran. I am the district court administrator in Jefferson County. All right. And I echo Judge Williams. Thanks everyone for attending. I um, want to take this opportunity to give you all a brief overview of where district court reopening is going. First of all, it is beginning uh, June 15th will be our reopening and it will be done in a very limited manner. It is not an opening of the courthouse doors as a lot of people and sometimes media has portrayed it to be. And so the one thing that is, uh, there are a couple of things that I hope that you all can keep in mind. Uh, that the one is that this is temporary um, going forward, we're trying to come up with ways that we can reopen with the number one thing of being safety, especially on in-person dockets, um, is being paramount. So, and the other thing is, it's going to take all of us, judges, clerks, lawyers, everyone, to start to rethink about how we've always done things. And realize that we're uh, in a different world now and we're going to be doing things a little differently. So to the best of everyone's ability, the protocol was signed off by the Supreme Court and it is on the district court website. I encourage you to read it and pull it down. I'm always available to answer questions. I know Judge Williams is through the L. She's our uh, through the LBA, as well as anyone not a member of the LBA. Um, most, any of the district court judges are, are fully capable of, of answering any of, your, any of your questions. I wanna highlight it, <laughs> some parts. I don't, I'm not, my intent is not to read it to you. I just simply wanna go through and highlight some, uh, kind of give it an overview. And again, encourage as many questions as we can here. Uh, and then go uh, and be available for any uh, further questions. Basically, you have to look going forward at district court into two categories. There's the criminal side of district court and the civil side of district court. As indicated in the protocol preamble, it, it will be uh, strongly encouraged, strongly preferred, strongly, you know, fill in the gaps, that defendants appear remotely and attorneys appear remotely. But you'll notice one big dis 
distinction between the criminal cases and the civil cases. Civil cases um, use the word shall. Those shall be conducted remotely, either through the Zoom apps that are gonna be provided or on telephone, unless the judge determines in his or her discretion that the matter requires an in-person attendance. So just kind of separate those two out in, in your mind as we go forward. There's a little bit of a caveat. It's, it's just odd, but we just, the way we're structured, a juvenile docket will be considered for the purposes of this protocol as a civil docket. Um, so that's going to be underneath the civil um, side. On the criminal cases, uh, the in-custody arraignment will be pretty much has uh, the same as we have been uh, doing it uh, since the original shutdown for the courts. There's not much of a change on that. Um, I will do a, a caveat. These protocols are, are going to be pretty strictly enforced. So please, if you want to appear on an in-custody docket and you want to appear remotely, you have to follow these protocols. Do not text the judge directly. So anyone coming out of, the, out of jail, out of a custody situation will be given at least a 14 day date for their next appearance. Post arraignment in custody, um, if you kind of notice we've moved the courtrooms around, basically the in custody courtrooms, people who are in custody, in custody being defined as being in jail or on home incarceration. Those will all be done on the second floor. Those are gonna be second floor courtrooms. So some of you all may be used to the old uh, 301 or 102, but uh, starting this week, they will be um, on the second floor. This is a big change uh, for lawyers practicing on the criminal side of district court. The redocket slips will not be accepted for those um, dockets. You may request to add a case onto the docket by emailing the case managers at 4 p.m. And no uh, 4 p.m. the day before, no uh, redockets are going to be processed after 4 p.m. the day before. So please make sure you follow that protocol. There is an listed in the protocol for telephonic appearances um, on those and um, again it sets out if you want to appear telephonically you have to also send the case managers an email to say I want to appear telephonically that's a little bit different make sure you catch the difference that's a little bit different than the in custody arraignment docket the in custody arraignment docket is going to be handled through pretrial services this is post arraignment in custody goes through the case managers. Now on the out of custody cases, we're doing a, a phased in reopening on that. And those are going to be concentrated in the beginning where any a felony case where the 20 day date has not been waived a domestic violence case, a DUI case and a limited number of theft cases. Please be, <clears throat> please be cognizant of the fact that as in the beginning, it is only one additional courtroom that's, all, that's going to be run. A very limited number of defendants will be brought in per hour. They will be given the option through their court notice as will the attorneys to appear remotely. And that is also sent out, there will be instructions um, to uh, follow if you want to appear remotely or if a, a defendant wants to appear remotely. The big key here is whether uh, this, uh, the health and safety protocols have to be met and we have to get everyone on board on how that is met. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> it used to be that you would hand someone a file or you would walk up to the bench or you would walk up to the recommender. That is not happening anymore. So the judges are very mindful of that. 
and we'll um, be monitoring that. We cannot, and I cannot emphasize this enough, we cannot in these courtrooms violate any of the safety and health um, standards as issued by the Supreme Court. Our little prints on the Hall of Justice uh, floors for people to follow. Um, the sheriffs are going to start helping us implement those feet. And there's a flow pattern that has got to be followed. I'm just skipping through. You can read about how um, each courtroom will have a Zoom license with a meeting ID and a password. Those will be posted on the Jefferson District Court website. The website is called jeffersondistrictcourt.com. Um, and you can pull off the meeting ID, ID numbers and the passwords. Those meeting ID numbers and passwords will stay the same. So um, that's gonna be the, the remote link into that courtroom. Arrest warrants, we're limiting those again to only Monday through Friday from nine to 10 a.m. Again, you have to send a, a request to the case managers no later than four o'clock the day before um, for those arrest warrants. As you can tell, going through this as, as quickly as I am, there is a strong emphasis, a strong encouragement. We are very much limiting the people into this building. If you do not fit one of the qualifications of the Supreme Court order, being a, an attorney that has a case on the docket, that has a case that day, and I don't have the list right in front of me, but it's on the Supreme Court order, you are not going to be given access to the building. So we have a redocket process that we have used in criminal on a pro se redocket. Those will be, they will be directed to a drop box out front um, for that information. And then uh, court notices will be sent uh, to, the, to the individual uh, regarding their request to place the um, case on the docket. And then, so it kind of breaks down how you go about doing that. All requests to, to set aside bench warrants, either by a pro se individual or by an attorney, will be forwarded to the county attorney's office first. The county attorney's office, the county attorney's office has been great about going through those and agreeing to set aside um, a number of bench warrants and that is in compliance with the Supreme Court order. And, um, so that, that process is already in place and that's been working really well. Now for those uh, criminal defense attorneys um, out there, if a criminal defense attorney is requesting to set aside a bench warrant or redocket a case, we have set up what is called a prompt attention protocol that is also up on the website. You have to follow that uh, prompt attention protocol on a request to set aside a bench warrant or other redocket reason. These are out of custody cases. Again, you take the criminal side, you take all of district court and you split it into two, criminal and civil. You take the criminal side and you split it into two, in custody, out of custody. The procedures are different. Um, so you just have to kind of look at what kind of case you have. We are also setting up an in-person out of custody docket. And that is a docket where notice is going to be required. Notice meaning, I give just an example as a motion to revoke by the county attorney's office. They will email and get a date for that. And then they can put it into their notice. Um, on those dates. And there's going to be a limited number of slots for that. Uh, if lawyers out there have pleas that they want to get entered on out of custody cases, you go through this in-person out of custody docket. 
Show causes are, uh, will not be, begin to be scheduled until uh, after November the 1st. Show causes, let me qualify, show causes for payment of fines and costs. So again, this is a brief overview and I'm trying to be mon mindful of our time. Civil cases, evictions. Evictions, I will just throw it out there, is, has been a very difficult um, issue to, to grapple with. Those have to be done remotely. That's on the civil side. So we have, we have been working diligently on doing that. Now, for those lawyers out there, there is what is called a verification form. And I pulled the, the number. Do you go to the AOC website or to kycourts.gov and the um, AOC form number is 1026.1. Let me emphasize this very clearly as much as I can. Under the Supreme Court latest order dealing with evictions, absolutely no eviction can be filed or processed without this verification form. That also includes writs. So writs for possession have to have the verification form. Now, for those of you who have evictions pending or who have writs pending, we can't process anything. And I, I'll say it again, we cannot process anything without a verification form. So what I would suggest is what we're trying to do is is if you all want to go ahead and download the forms online and start filling those out, motions to dismiss, um, we would love to have as many of those as, as possible. Um, go ahead and we can start um, accepting, accepting those beginning June 15th. All right, make sure this protocol doesn't go in until June the 15th. So you can go ahead and get your verifications ready and your motions to dismiss ready. We are starting this at a docket off very slowly. We, the preliminary discussions are that we will go with when we get the verifications back, that will kind of set the stage for the dockets. We have language that will be on the court notices indicating individuals how um, they can appear on that docket remotely. So um, again, we're trying to keep getting things up on the website as quickly as possible. Please refer back to the website. If we are trying to group the landlords in chronological order, but again, we have to have this verification form before we do anything. If you want to appear remotely, you have to email the Jefferson, it's called Jeffco Evictions, contact at kycourts.net, no earlier than three business days beforehand. That way we kind of know who's, who is, and, and you have to do that. You're going to have to appear remotely. And then again, there is a Zoom license and a personal meeting ID for that docket. I don't think it's as applicable here, but just so you'll know, small claims will not be starting back up until July 1st. Civil motion hour, um, we are um, trying to, um, Get that up and going. Uh, obviously, we have till June, that Friday of June 15th. If you have a pending motion that was caught between the, the courts closing down and reopening, you need, you have to, you must provide a notice of contact information. Make sure you have that um, uh, case number on it. Well, again, send court notices out with how the respondent can appear remotely. Lawyers, you're appearing remotely on these. Unless the judge makes the determination after, at the time that you all are before the judge, unless the judge makes a determination that an in-person hearing is necessary. 
MLW guardianship that's been up and running remotely, it's just going to basically follow the exact same procedure for those of you who are interested in MIW guardianship. Uh, juvenile court has been, those judges also have been doing a good job doing that remotely. It seems to be working pretty well. Again, it, even though it's a criminal, in, in our world, it's a criminal docket, it is going to be handled the same way the civil dockets are, and that is remotely. There are instructions um, on how to um, go through and, and deal with that docket remotely. I understand that non-detained juveniles do not have court dates yet. We are working diligently on getting those um, petitions on non-detained juveniles up and going. Um, there will be notices sent out uh, to all the parties regarding that. Um, if Again, if you've got a plea, a resolution, the parties need to email the judge and let them know and a special time is going to be created. Now probate court, for those of you who are interested in probate court, um, unfortunately the, the original thing was, and it's still in the protocol, that the docket shall begin the first week of June. We, are, we have been doing those. Um, emergency appointments all through um, all from from the beginning um, up until now and that actually is starting in Ernst on June 15th and please pay attention to the difference in the times the appointment docket will be at 11 and it set sets forth one of the, there are two major issues on here. One are these original wills. The court must have that original will in that case file or it, no later than 24 hours before the scheduled hearing. Please use the drop boxes. And then at one o'clock, the motion and notice docket. And again, it's in the judge's discretion, all of that is going uh, remote unless the judge in his or her discretion determines that an in-person hearing is required and that will be set at a particular time. There will not be a rule docket at this point in time. We will start that at a future date. Then all contested probate hearings will be scheduled at a date designated by the court. All efforts are being made to reschedule these in chronological order. But um, again, some have been pulled off, some have been moved. It's all of the efforts are doing it in chronological order. Uh, the interpersonal protective order, we have already been running that remotely. That's going to stay the way it is in terms of remotely. And again, unless there is an exemption in his or her presence. Jury trials, um, We've reached an agreement with circuit. Circuit's jury trials are gonna start August 1st. We are, unless there's some good cause, we would prefer not to start jury trials until October 1st, just so the staging and all that get worked, gets worked out. We may start those a little bit earlier than October 1st. We're just gonna wait and let circuit deal with the, the staging of the pettit jurors. We will always have remote access. We are not a court that, that operates um, without transparency. If there is an interested party or uh, media or something that's interested in attending the proceeding, then um, there's an email address. The recordings are done, um, and then most of this um, uh, are, is self um explanatory. There is going to be a movement of some courtrooms. Again, check the website. Uh, we will, we're diligently trying to keep that updated. Please check the, the website about if you are coming in person, where you might be attending. We are just uh, moving around courtrooms based on how many people we're anticipating dockets to have. All entry and exit and, and social contact communication will be handled um, uh, 
by the by the court and regardless uh, if it's a civil case or a criminal case, it will be handled in the same fashion. Wow, that was a mouthful. So um, I see we're at 227. I just really wanted to give an opportunity for people to ask questions. Right, Judge Haney, um, I've answered um, some that have come into the queue because I've read them, um, but then I've got some that I'll, I'll read out loud um, for the group. Um, and then if you could answer, um, and then I can mark those um, okay. for some that we still have in queue. Um, some, from someone we have, just to uh, clarify, even eviction cases pending before March 25th, will there uh, need a verification? Okay, yes. Let me, um, and that's gonna be a little confusion, confusing, but I've uh, talked to um, legal counsel uh, for AOC yesterday because I actually had that exact same question. Um, it is per made perfectly clear to me, all, capitalize the A and the LL and bold it. There is never going to be an eviction case before the court without a verification form. So yes, it will require a verification form. Okay, thank you. The next is um, another uh, question has, how should we go about requesting copies of civil slash probate files? Requesting copies of a civil probate file, that would go through the clerk's office like it would anyway. Judges aren't, um, um, you know, we don't, we don't do that. The clerk's office, they're the keeper of the record. So I would suggest uh, contacting David Nicholson's office. Um, in terms of how that's happening. And, and I truthfully, I don't know how they're doing that now. I know that when I was down there today, there was someone in there copying a file, okay. so, but I don't know how they're doing okay. it. In regarding small claims beginning July 1st, how can a pro se litigant file? Will they be allowed to access the clerk's office? No, um, they can either e-file or use a Dropbox. Okay. On evictions, um, for non-payment uh, evictions that were filed uh, prior to the shutdown and that were canceled, can those move forward beginning June 15th? No, unless it is uh, non-payment on a commercial property. Now you've got to realize there's, there's a couple of things and, and I always say to people, I somehow missed the pandemic seminar in law school. So you have to <laughs> you have to balance the CARES Act, which is more than I ever wanted to read. The CARES Act versus the governor's order versus the Supreme Court order. Non-payment of rent on residential facilities cannot be filed. Non-payment of rent for commercial facilities places can be filed. Evictions on residential for something other than non-payment of rent may be filed and heard by the court. I understand that there's a, I know because I've gone through all of them, there is a group of non-payment for residential purposes that were filed before the COVID crisis. Under all the CARES Act, and we have to follow the federal law and the Supreme Court order, those will not be placed on the docket. Okay, we've got an IPO um, question. Um, for IPO hearings, how can litigants provide exhibits remotely? We haven't worked that out exactly. Um, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but as of right now, what we're doing is if you have an exhibit and you want to provide it remotely, you have to share it with the other side, obviously, which is problem number one. Problem number, and then, but I usually have the parties um, email it um, to me. It, it's odd because the other side, you're supposed to show it to the other side. And I will tell you, I've got a couple of cases where the exhibits were just too voluminous. There was a lot of um, disagreement about who did what. So I just set those down for in-person hearings. And, um, that's, um, so sometimes by email, you would just have to ask it's, if it can be exchanged earlier, 
Um, and Kelsey, who is who is just great, just uh, sent out, I think, to the group, the uh, evictions verification form link. Um, so uh, that's kind of catch as catch can on IPOs um, so far. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see, scrolling through here. Guardianship um, says a quick explanation of that. Jury trials, oh wait, it just went away, sorry. After October 1st question. So I guess they're asking on guardianship, will jury trials begin after October 1st? On guardianship jury trials, if there's good cause that it needs to occur between August and October, just please petition the MIW guardian or the guardianship judge we really are trying desperately not to do district court um, uh, jury trials until October 1st. But there are going to be some cases where it's important to get those in. So the, the strong preference, desire, they are not gonna be scheduled until after October 1st. But if if things go as smoothly as the circuit court reopening has gone this week, we would like to um, uh, expedite all of this. Again, I preface everything by saying these are temporary um, protocols to get us through the reopening. It's unclear as exactly how long this reopening process is going to work. One second, I'm typing an answer to someone really quickly, just asking about when we're going to start doing the non-payments. And I'm referring everybody to our website, which is www.jeffersondistrictcourt.com. Um, you're going to need to check back on that website for updates. Um, and someone just asked, how long do we expect this to happen? And, or how long do we expect these rules to be in place? And we simply don't know. Um, but if you check out our website, which I'm typing into uh, on here, um, we will be updating that often and frequently. Um, if you will simply check that out, uh, we will provide updates as we get them. Um, so I'm responding to this really quickly. Okay. Website. So I'm trying to multitask, which I pride myself on, but this is a lot to do right now. So one second. Bear with me and excuse all typos. That's going to drive me crazy, but it is what it is, people. One second. Okay. All right. Sorry, and I don't mean to be so brief in my responses, but I'm trying to answer your questions as I type them so that you can have a response of some sort. So I, I don't mean my brevity to be um, dismissive of your question. I'm just simply trying to answer it and get that out there for you. Um, let's see what else we've got going on here. So we have some in the queue. Um, I answered that one. Oh, that's still there. Done. Done. Okay. The Dropbox instructions. This is a question. The Dropbox instructions say, not to deposit original wills. Judge Haney just said to put wills in a drop box. So file original wills in a drop box, question. We're working on our signage. Give us some patience. Um, I know that that was on the original sign. Um, we are, um, we're working on it. Please drop original wills. What a lot of lawyers have been doing is contacting uh, the clerk's office and saying, hey, I've got an original will here. And the clerks have been just wonderful about just running down the steps, picking it up from the lawyer, social distancing wise, out front, and then just running it back up. So if you have some concerns about that, just call the clerk's office and they've been great about running down. Okay, and then here's another one. Um, let's see, where did that one go? This is a probate question. Please go through one more time how to appear in probate court for a petition. How to handle witnesses to a will who have to see the will to testify about it. Um, how we've been doing that is you will be given a Zoom app um, that, you, that you will need to pass on to any witnesses that you're calling and uh, use the procedure through the Zoom app so everyone can see the documents, everyone can look at them. Uh, most lawyers so far have been given a copy of the original, obviously is with the court, has been given a copy to the other side or presenting a copy to their witnesses. 
and the court has been confirming that um, and then showing through the Zoom app the original document. And once your case is set, you have to appear remotely. If for some reason it does not work, which it, it has been working, but if something goes awry, it's always in the court's discretion whether or not to have an in-person hearing. So you will get pretty proficient with Zoom. And uh, so that's basically how we've been doing it. And this question uh, for Kelsey, someone's asking about, is it safe to list the Zoom passwords publicly over the internet um, since people can drop into Zoom meetings and possibly disrupt them? That is something we are working on AOC um, with currently. The issue is that there is no way to court notice everyone um, and constantly change the Zoom ID and the Zoom password um, because the court notices will go out and then people won't have access to court by the time we have to change it. Um, so we are talking to them about our best options um, and we will uh, let everyone know the passwords will be given to all attorneys so that they can join the meeting uh, one way or another. We will provide that information. Um, you know, courts are open to the public, so we're not super worried about um, people necessarily dropping in to see a proceeding. Any um, confidential proceeding will be taking place in a private Zoom that will be getting a private um, a private password and a private ID sent directly to the parties. But for all public matters, um, we're just not necessarily as concerned about the drop-ins at this point in time, but it's something we're aware of. Okay, and then I've got another question I'm gonna ask, but just to address um, the chat, and please guys, don't chat your questions and then also ask in the q and I, can, I can't, I am, I am amazing and I recognize that, but I can't do okay. all of this. So I need you to just ask your questions in the Q&A and not ask questions in the chat too. But I did see one pop up in there and it's asking um, for case manager contact info and that is also located in the, um, in the protocols that's gonna be listed on our website. And also the LBA is gonna be kind enough to put our protocol on their website as well. So Fred, that case manager contact info will be listed on there, the, both of their um, uh, email addresses will be on there, okay? Um, so back to our Q&A, just because I, I saw that over the other yeah, Judge corner. Williams, can I jump in really quick just to yes. direct? If you, go, if you go to the website and click on COVID-19 updates, it'll be under either the local updates or just the general COVID-19 page. You can find our protocol in both spots. Yes, and then their contact information is, is within that. Um, and, and we may be able to make it a, even a little more simple to just put some contact information on there. So Kelsey and I will work on that and maybe make it to where you're not having to sift through that. So if you're just trying to find contact information for them, um, we can just maybe have a link for that so that it's easy for you. So we just got our website um, up not too long ago, so we're still working on it, um, but maybe we can make that a little more simple. So back to our Q&A um, questions, we just have 20 more minutes. Um, these are some criminal uh, court questions, um, kind of uh, dealing with access. Um, and so we've got two kind of in, in one. Um, one is, have any steps been taken to resolve the problem of attorneys not being able to speak privately to their in-custody client on the day of and during court proceedings? Well, we've experienced that problem from day one. And um, so obviously, if we had an easy solution to that problem, we're now, what, how many weeks into this? We would have figured that out. We just simply don't have it a way to do it and figure it out. And, and that is, um, and that's just how it is. We're, we know it, we recognize it, um, we get it, we get that there's an issue there, but um, it's not, it hasn't been quite resolved yet. And along those lines, um, this is kind of the same, um, Kind of, but um, with criminal cases, uh, so that they don't have to be continued, why can't each district courtroom have more than one phone line for attorneys to talk to their in-custody clients? That's a, a jail issue, <laughs> and um, we would love to have more than one phone line, but there's only so many phone lines at the jail, and so um, we are limited. We actually even went so far as to bring the city over to try to install more phone lines. We've looked at burner phones. We've looked at all kinds of stuff. 
to try to to try to fix this. And um, so as of right now, there is no ability to expand the phone lines. And I know that Circuit is working on this exact issue as well, because you've got to remember their custodies are limited to two hours in the afternoon. And so, so one of the things that's also being looked at is to try to install some phone lines up in Echo on the fourth floor so prisoners will at least come over to the fourth floor but right now there's no telephones over there there are no more phone lines and we can't wave a magic wand and make that any better okay um here's some probate questions um and sorry guys i'm not skipping over any questions i'm just trying to kind of scroll through and keep us moving so that we can hit on as many topics as we can um so if we don't get to answer all of your questions today i apologize you guys we're asking some really good questions and we're just trying to cover as much as we can so that everybody kind of has um, most of it answered and in an hour is just not going to be enough time to do it. You guys have some really good questions. Um, so for probate, um, we've got a couple. Um, do we need to call the clerk to give them our email or is there an email address for the clerk to send it? I, I'm not sure what there is going to be an email address associated with probate and um, you uh, that that email address will go up on our website yes. and on probate the lawyers you know there's going to be some scheduling we ask that you use that email address for um, your remote contact information okay and for the appointment of an executor how will they sign the bond well, we've been doing that and we'll probably continue with the same procedure. There's either going to be a limited POA that you can sign for the fiduciary yourself or have it pre-signed and the court will fill out the amount. Um, usually that's dropped in the Dropbox or it can be e-filed. Um, some lawyers have been uncomfortable with that and I get that part of it too. So. On the lawyers who are like, I don't feel comfortable with the fiduciary signing ahead of time, what we've been doing is just setting the bond amount on the appointments and then instructing the lawyer to then e-file, assign, holding the calls until the e-signed or the, the fiduciary bond form is signed and e-filed. Okay. Um, on expungements, will petitions continue to be handled off docket to the extent possible? Yes. <laughs> that one's easy. I need more yep. of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll type that one out. So we have a of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then we've got another one. Um, this is probably pertaining to um, the protocol in which uh, an attorney will let uh, the court know if they're going to appear remotely or in person. Um, what should an attorney do if they are not retained until after the cutoff for notifying the court as to their client's remote or in-person appearance? Um, that's that's a huge uh, problem. We have to have a cutoff. Actually, the cutoff issue was um, was in, put in by the Supreme Court, and um, so maybe instruct the, the the individual that they to tell the court that they have hired an attorney and they need a new court date. We can't bend on those cutoffs, um, and. The problem on the uh, eviction cutoff being three days ahead of time is because we have to have staff go through those emails and marry those emails up with the actual case. So we have to have time to make that happen. Um, so that's how come that, that particular one is three days uh, ahead of time. And uh, so please, um, and, I, and I, um, I actually had that same question because a lot of lawyers aren't um, hired until kind of in that spot be beforehand. I just have to tell you, the cutoff is the cutoff. And, um, and that's, that's how it is. Again, with this new process, you all, we're just gonna have to, everybody's gonna have to remain um, flexible in a lot of regards, but then also understanding in order to make this work, we're going to have to stick with a lot of parameters because there's just so many um, things that we, we can't control. Um, and with so many moving parts, it's important to have 
um, parameters in place that we're going to have to stick to um, while remaining as flexible as possible in, in, in some areas. So we just ask for patience in a, in a lot of this as we can all continue to work together and, and get through this. And if you, um, and one of the things is go back, we are going to, as we go through this, we're going to realize what might work and what is absolutely not working. So uh, we're starting off so slowly, just incredibly slow to try to work through a lot of these issues. We cannot risk the safety and the health of anyone coming into this building. So all of this is going to be done remotely on the civil side and highly encouraged to do so on the criminal side. So um, as we work through this, we're going to figure out what is absolutely uh, an, a, a solid obstacle that uh, are preventing people from, from getting work done. So um, in fact, someone asked me this morning about, you know, the 90 case eviction docket. Uh, well, that's not happening. So, um, so that was an, an easy way to answer that. So please um, understand it's going to be slow. Someone's asking if a pro se litigant does not have internet access, what options do they have for appearing remotely? Not, I can speak to that one. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a remote docket now, um, a prompt attention docket that is run telephonically, which um, I also encourage people to take advantage of that. And so that, that's another option. Um, everything doesn't have to be via internet. It can be via uh, telephone to, to call into um, because we can still record that. I mean, um, Kelsey, go ahead. And with some of the Zoom options and things, it's not just video. You can also call in um, to those. So all of our um, Zoom and Skype, whatever method we're using, there's also a way to call into that um, for, for the person that asked that. So it doesn't have to be via internet. There's also a phone call, a way to phone, a call in. Some, some of the people participating today are not um, doing this uh, via internet. They've called into it. So we have an option for, for most. And hopefully, and if there is a problem, is again, we'll have to be patient and work through this and, and make accommodations as we can. All court notices are going to include the um, call in line in addition to the Zoom ID code to enter. So they'll, you can enter either way. Um, and we'll post both the telephone and the ID code on the website. Yes. Um, we've got another probate question. So in probate cases where the attorney is signing the bond, as POA, can they sign the bond in the presence of a notary and file it when they file a petition? Yes, you can um, under these under the temporary thing. Um, we're trying to make it uh, remote as difficult, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible. So the short answer to that is yes, you may. Okay, got another expungement question. I've mm -hmm. had several expungements which were already scheduled. Uh, and then it says rescheduled with late fall dates. Should these just be refiled, re-e-filed is what it says? No, we actually um, have piles because <laughs> um, we still are a paper system. D uh, Jefferson uh, District Court is not a paperless system. So we still, um, so no, please don't e-file and create a duplicate. We haven't lost track of you, although it may feel like we have lost track of you, we haven't lost track of you. Um, so um, that short answer to that is, is no. You don't need to re-file. How will motions for a bill of discovery work in civil cases uh, with the remote appearances by all parties? Oh my gosh, um, I was waiting for that question. And uh, there it is, I saved it for last. There we go. Uh, no. um, because, oh Lord, is that gonna be difficult. Um, you know, of course, we're going to have the attorney's contact information. The initial thought is there are still some areas we're trying to work out. And that is on your motion, of course, you'll is that in the certificate of service, there may be some more orders coming that in the certificate of service, you will have to include the, the Zoom, the phone number, and all of that. Um, in your certificate of service um, so that the other party, especially pro se, I was thinking of wage garnishments <clears throat> that we see a lot on the civil side and how to get that contact information 
to the individual to appear remotely. And, um, and so as of right now, although a firm decision hasn't been made, but there may be some follow-up, there will be some follow-up orders. Uh, and one may, uh, is that we're looking at is that the, the, the attorney will be, have an obligation to put that contact information in their certificate of service. And then one, uh, another one is, um, do attorneys clock and drop final settlements? Clock and drop filed settlement. Final, final, final settlements. settlements. Oh, okay. Um, there's really no clocking and dropping. There's a drop box. <laughs> and, um, and so you use the drop box or mail, uh, and uh, so there's really, there is, I emphasize again, there's no ability to get inside the building unless you fit within the qualifications of the Supreme Court order. So uh, uh, you would just use the drop box out front for that. And I know some of these are big. So I have um, uh, encouraged lawyers to call the clerk's office directly if you've got something that's, that's big and uh, the clerks are great about running down and getting it from you or your runner. I'm sure you're uh, from your runners. Another probate in probate for the one o'clock motion docket on notice to non-lawyers such as a notice for, sorry, such as motion for approval of proposed settlement. Is there any specific language we need to include? For example, you must log in to object, et cetera. Right, we're working on that language, and that also might be, again, it's this whole thing about notification on the other side, especially on pro se individuals. And um, I would, we're looking at that being in your certificate of service that you will have to um, drop that information in that certificate of, of service so that the other side knows how to object for a motion to sell real estate, let's say, or you know, a proposed final. And then um, someone has two probate questions. Can we still use POA to appoint executor or do we need them to appear through Zoom? No, you can use your POA or they can appear through Zoom. It's your choice. And then, um, someone's asking, how will petitions to file informal papyrus be handled when tendering with a filing? Um, on those motions, um, the clerks, again, we're, a lot of us judges and clerks and all that, we're in the building and, and we're working. It's going to be handled the same way, kind of off docket, that it used to be handled. Uh, original wills on e-filed probate matters were being delivered directly to the county clerk along with the order of probate has that process now changed correct you cannot deliver directly to the county clerk with an order uh, to probate the court has to have that original will before um, that state can be opened we have a process in place with the county clerk's office and they're coming to pick up our disability judgments and our probate matters once a week to be filed. And then someone's asking, what is the process for the court will use to separate witnesses for civil hearings slash small claims? This kind of goes along with the question about introducing exhibits. Oh, I guess the question is separation of witnesses. I think uh, so, I'm just reading it exactly question. as it's typed. Okay, I'm not sure I'm answering the question correctly. Um, but if it's a motion for separation of witnesses and the court grants that motion, the court has the ability to put someone in a waiting room and so they will not be admitted. Um, so if they're witnesses, we are still working on the exhibit issue. Um, and, uh, we're still trying to work out ways that that can be exchanged. Uh, again, I'll, you know, I fall back on the website as we work out issues now going forward. We'll just put them up on on the website, you know. And and I encourage you all. Uh, although I, um, we're all all the judges um, have been working diligently and hard, 
and um, doing an excellent, excellent job. If you want to reach out with me, I had a couple of lawyers reach out over the last couple of months with what I thought were excellent ideas, absolutely wonderful ideas that I would never have thought of on my own, or I don't think we uh, judges would have thought of to collectively. So, um, uh, cause you all come at it from a different perspective. Uh, my email, my door, um, I don't know how you get into the building, but um, is always, uh, my phone is always open. Um, I've been, I try to be responsive. If you all have some ideas, I know that um, I met with circuit judges today and they're struggling with some of these same issues. Uh, and so um, just please, uh, please feel free. As I stated earlier, I missed the class on closing a courthouse or opening one back up or pandemics in law school. So I'm trying to be mindful of everyone's rights and interests. And, and um, But I also have to balance that with the safety and the health of the people in this building. So I'm totally open to ideas and suggestions. So. Um, and I've got one more just before we go. Uh -huh. But someone's asking, are criminal cases set for tomorrow being passed? The case that was set for 9 now shows 2 a.m. Right. <laughs> we put it, um, I'm glad someone brought that up. Uh, yes. Okay, again, we don't start out-of-custody cases until June 15th. We'll probably, truthfully, not get to June 15th because we have asked AOC to submit to us a list of cases um, in that order so we can start redocketing cases as of this afternoon. I don't have that list. So we're getting pretty close to the wire to get to June 15th. So I'm afraid of, that's a type of case that I was afraid of losing somewhere going forward. So um, I uh, want to, uh, so we that 2 a.m is just a placeholder, so we don't lose track of that case. No out of custody cases are on the dockets currently. I hope that answered that. Yes, I think so. Okay. Do we have time for just one more? Um, let's see if I can find a quick one. Um, well, someone's just asking too again about um, to go through one more time about how to appear in probate court for a petition and how to handle witnesses to a will who have to see the will to testify about it. All right. The original will, again, is going to be filed with the court. The um, Zoom app will allow that to occur and um, the witness can be shown through the Zoom, uh, the original will. Like I said, most lawyers have been given a copy of that to their witnesses that they're calling. At least I can tell you how I've been doing that. I've just been confirming and, uh, with the individual that that was the same document that I had in my possession. And using the, I don't know, the, the media through Zoom to do that. And, um, and it will just be like like every other uh, case. Uh, so uh, if the court again feels like for some reason that can't happen, there is always the what I call the out provision of an in-person hearing. I can't emphasize how much that is not where we're going on the civil side. So as we start this you come up with their processes been able to successfully do that through the use of the Zoom apps. Thank you. All right, Anything else? Is that it? I think that's thank all we have time. Yeah, we're right at three. Judges, thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you so much for answering all of these questions. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, so with that, we will close. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, if you'll stay on for just one second. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.
All right. Okay, ladies, I need you to smile. Oh. Perfect. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll end it now. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.